The August 2023 broadcast of ABS Web, the American Bonanza Society monthly webinar program, included a review of accident statistics for ABS type airplanes to date this year and an open question and answer period. Live viewers had the opportunity to ask questions and we received many more than we had time during the webinar to answer. This time in the ABS hangar, ask the instructor bonus questions from the recent ABS web webinar. Hi, I'm Tom Turner, Executive Director of the ABS Air Safety Foundation. The bonus questions that we received may be grouped into four different categories. First, Piston Beach Accident Data. One viewer asked, isn't data like that presented in the 2021 to 2023 period questionable because we don't necessarily know how many airplanes were flying in one year versus another? That's a very common um, criticism and a valid one of all accident study data. Uh, when AOPA's Air Safety Institute uh, researches and publishes the NAL report, or when I use accident data to write an article for ABS Magazine or post something on the website. We make a lot of assumptions. One of the biggest assumptions we make is aircraft use patterns. We don't know how many hours per year the average beach airplane is flown, and we don't know how that might change from one year to another. What we can do is to use the same assumptions every year so that we have at least comparable data from one year to the next. And that's what the entire industry does. If you ever get the uh, request from the FAA for fleet data or your operator's use data, how many hours you've flown in the previous year, how frequently your airplane has flown, those sorts of things, the FAA's queries are designed to provide as much information as possible about the use of aircraft. So we know how many airplanes are actually flying and how many uh, hours those airplanes have flown. And that's the only way that we can make any real assumption of accidents per flight hour. So when I do a comparison of accident data from one year to the next, or when anybody else does that for that matter, uh, AOPA or EAA or anyone else, we're making an assumption that uh, we don't know exactly how frequently airplanes have been flown, but we're going to assume that the number is roughly constant over time so that we can at least attempt to develop some trends data. So, no, it's, it's not perfect information by a long shot, but it's the best that we have. Another viewer asked, do the low numbers reflect less aircraft use? Um, I think it does. Uh, I think that there is substantially lower aircraft use uh, now than, let's say, 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Uh, some of the information we get from the insurance industry tells us that the average Bonanza flies about 35 to 50 hours a year, and the average Baron flies maybe 100 to 150 hours a year. And those numbers are probably quite a bit lower than they were many years ago. At least we, we work under that assumption. So uh, it, it may be that there are fewer hours being flown, uh, there are fewer pilots flying these airplanes, it may be a valid assumption. And so the, over time, the numbers are going to change. So as I said before, we have to speculate on the hours flown in these airplanes, and we also have to reevaluate those speculations over time so that we can get the most valid data that we can. Of the engine failures that resulted in fatalities, were any in Barron's? Uh, not so far this year. Uh, there have not have been any uh, fatal Barron engine failure accidents reported so far in 2023. 
Another question, is there any data about fuel exhaustion? Not yet, except there was one fuel exhaustion specifically cited by the NTSB so far this year. Historically, if you go back to go back far enough to find uh, final or probable cause reports for uh, ABS type airplane accidents, uh, as I've reported many times before, as much as 90% of all of the NTSB reportable engine failure accidents were the result of fuel mismanagement on the part of the pilot. Fuel starvation, which is running a tank dry while there's still fuel available in another tank and for whatever reason not being able to get the engine restarted. Or fuel exhaustion when you run completely out of gas. I suspect that two or three years from now when most of the information for 2023 has been fully investigated that we'll see a continuation of this trend. In your opinion, do you think that the engine failure related accidents are the result of improper or lack of maintenance? Actually, no, there's there's really good information that uh, most catastrophic in-flight engine failures, in other words, when there's a known mechanical cause for the engine failure. In most cases, it is uh, assembly error on an engine that has been through a field overhaul or had other work done uh, away from a factory setting. Uh, there, there is virtually no history of um, engine failure for factory new engines and for factory rebuilt engines uh, until the engine has a, a substantial amount of time in service. Uh, occasionally, there are some metallurgical issues that would arise early in the engine history. But, uh, for example, back in uh, March of 2016, Mike Bush uh, wrote in AOPA Pilot Magazine that uh, infant mortality from new engines and factory rebuilt engines doesn't exist. It's not in the accident history. Uh, what we do see in accident history is improper reassembly during a field overhaul or a field replacement of a cylinder or other heavy engine maintenance done away from uh, a factory setting uh, that uh, results in catastrophic engine failure. So, uh, no, um, uh, not really anything that is uh, maintenance specific, at least not yet. Uh, we'll see what happens when the investigations are eventually uh, completed. My mechanic has always been a stickler on annual gear rigging. That said, what are some symptoms of a gear system being out of rig or developing some issues which could cause failure or difficulty? Well, the first thing is, yes, the gear rigging should be checked annually uh, by somebody who knows what they're doing. You can use that 38-step ABS landing gear inspection and rigging guide checklist uh, in your annual inspections to uh, detect any issues and to make any adjustments that are required. Um, between annual inspections, between these professional inspections, uh, if you notice that your landing gear system is uh, taking longer than normal to extend or retract, Instead of the normal four to five seconds in a 28 volt airplane and nine to 12 seconds in a in a 14 volt airplane, if it's taking substantially longer than that, uh, that tells you it's time probably for your gear motor overhaul, but uh, possibly some other uh, gear issue there as well. Another uh, telltale sign is if one or both of the inner gear doors sag when the airplane's sitting on the ground, you look under there and you see that those doors are drooping. That tells you that the gear is not completing its entire cycle. Now, it might be a gear door rigging issue or it might be indicative of something uh, that affects the entire landing gear system. So you definitely want to get these things checked out. You mentioned back in the accident data, you had mentioned something about engines breaking apart in flight. Would this be a problem that has to do with pilots improperly operating controllable pitch propellers? Uh, there's no evidence of that at all. There's not any indication in the accident record of uh, pilot mismanagement of the propeller control or manifold pressure versus RPM or any of that that uh, results in an accident or an engine failure in flight. As I said before, the engine failures that we see in the record are uh, generally 
uh, fuel-related issues. If there is a mechanical engine failure in flight, it's usually the result of improper reassembly of the engine following cylinder replacement or other heavy maintenance done away from a factory setting. Would you say you continue to see ABS-type accidents are related, as are most in general aviation, to basically flying into adverse weather or, too, or weather too bad for the experience or training level of the pilot, fuel mismanagement, loss of control in flight, which uh, the uh, reader or the viewer includes, uh, says includes poor handling of in-flight emergencies like the Duke with the flap failure that I wrote about in ABS Magazine recently. Historically, in the frequency of occurrence of reported Beechcraft mishaps, number one is landing gear-related mishaps. Of those, uh, the majority of those are gear collapse mishaps. And then, of course, we have the, uh, the oops, I forgot, gear up accidents. But that's the most common accident scenario by a fairly large margin in, pist in piston beach airplanes. Uh, engine failures come next, about 90% of them as we said before, eventually turn out to have been fuel mismanagement issues and a, a small amount of uh, uh, mechanical issues that uh, have been determined to be the cause of the accident. Uh, third, loss of control in flight, mostly stalls during a go around or initial takeoff, often combined with a high density altitude and or an airplane that's loaded uh, beyond its maximum gross weight and or out of its center of gravity limits. So most of the loss of control in flight accidents happen uh, on the takeoff or go around phase of flight. Some of them are low altitude maneuvering. Those are pretty rare, but when uh, those show up in the um, accident report, those, those are usually uh, classified as loss of control in flight as well. For those accidents, uh, those very few accidents that occur in actual instrument meteorological conditions. Most of them in our class of airplanes tend to be IFR pilots flying on IFR flight plans or uh, beginning on an IFR flight, maybe not actually having picked up the clearance yet, but then uh, entering conditions they're not prepared for or for which the airplane is not certificated, uh, flying in thunderstorms, flying in icing conditions, etc. And then uh, getting to the point where either the capability of the airplane or the capability of the pilot is exceeded. So uh, actual instrument conditions mishaps tend to be IFR pilots flying into adverse conditions, usually conditions that were known well in advance in our types of airplanes. Uh, we do occasionally see VFR into IMC accidents. Uh, given that uh, a poll of ABS members taken admittedly about a decade ago revealed that 90% or so of ABS members report holding an instrument rating. Uh, it's not unusual, it's not unexpected that the loss of control record in weather conditions might trend toward the IFR pilots and away from the VFR to IMC. The numbers I'm sure would be very different in other types of airplanes. Next, we had some questions about piloting technique. The first question from a viewer, when wouldn't it be safe to fly at peak EGT? Generally, it's accepted that any power setting below about 65% may be flown at any exhaust gas temperature because at those power settings, at that level of power development, uh, even the hottest temperatures will probably uh, not get anywhere near a point where EGT is high, driving CHT is high, and, and other associated issues. Uh, above 65% power, in general, uh, most uh, engine experts call for engine leaning either well rich of peak uh, to keep the temperatures and pressures down or well lean of peak for the same reasons. Lean of peak operation, by the way, significantly reduces power output. That's why the engines run cooler on the lean side. There's nothing magic about lean of peak that makes the engine cooler. It's simply that you've, uh, you've limited the amount of power being developed. For a given combination of manifold pressure and, and propeller RPM, if you're at 100 degrees Fahrenheit rich of peak, which is a maximum horsepower setting or so, and you were able to directly determine the percentage of horsepower being developed by your engine, and then 
without changing the manifold pressure or RPM, but leaning the mixture to get the mixture between 10 and 50 degrees or so lean of peak EGT, you would see between an 8 and 12 percent reduction in engine power, which means uh, that uh, when you go lean a peak, for a given manifold pressure and RPM, you're also lowering the uh, percentage of power as well. We usually talk about 23 inches of manifold pressure and 2300 RPM as being approximately 65% power. That's true if you lean per the book to 25 degrees Fahrenheit rich of peak. If you're richer than that, the percentage of power will be higher uh, to a point. If you're leaner than that, the percentage of power will be reduced. Uh, but uh, at uh, 23 inches and 2300 RPM, plus or minus maybe 10% is in the range that we normally operate. Uh, as you climb in altitude in a normally aspirated airplane and manifold pressure drops because the ambient pressure drops, you'll get to a point somewhere in the maybe six to 7,000 foot range where you can no longer maintain at least 23 inches of manifold pressure. By definition, above those altitudes, you're going to be below 65% power no matter what you do, and uh, consequently you can lean to any mixture setting that you want, including peak EGT. Very interestingly, in May of 2022, engine expert Mike Bush, who is probably the person that most of us learned about uh, all of these EGT issues and, and things from when uh, he was uh, originally writing with, with AvWeb in the 90s, and and, and then uh, really came out on his own as an, a, an engine advocate. Um, strangely enough, in the May 2022 issue of the Cirrus Owner and Pilots Association magazine, Mike wrote, quote, there is simply no statistically significant correlation between EGT and exhaust valve burning. It's a myth. Many of the things that we have learned about engines have proven to be untrue. Not all of those things were items that we were talking about in the 1970s and 1980s and 1990s. In other words, some myths have cropped up in the relatively recent past that have proven with uh, accident and investigative techniques to be, as we call some of the other things, old wives' tales. And it's becoming pretty apparent that uh, running your cylinders too hot results in exhaust valve burning is another one of those old wives tales. As long as the exhaust valve is fully seating and is rotating properly in operation, it dissipates the heat and the engine simply doesn't develop high enough temperatures, even at peak EGTs at high power settings, to do much damage to the exhaust valve. Where we get into trouble with exhaust valves is if they don't seat properly because uh, there's some sort of contamination underneath the valve or uh, the valve guide is, is installed slightly off kilter or something. And or if the valve is not able to rotate because the rotator cuff is, is damaged or, or warped or something. Those are the situations that result in exhaust valve burning. And that exhaust valve burning is going to happen at much lower temperatures, even normal operating temperatures that we strive for every day. So, uh, yes, uh, the, the probably the most prevalent answer to the question, uh, when can we operate at peak EGT if we want to, is at or below 65 percent power regardless of the altitude. If you got your power set to that, uh, the combination of manifold pressure, RPM, and fuel mixture results in something less than 65% power. That's generally accepted to be a point where we can do whatever we want with the mixture leaning. Uh, some of the data that uh, Mike Bush has recently published about tells us that maybe we're worrying too much about engine management issues. And frankly, in my opinion, uh, I've thought that for a long time. Um, we, um, we spend a lot of time uh, working and stressing and uh, trying to manipulate our engines to within a tenth of a degree of operation. But the things that we end up seeing in the accident reports are, are loss of control in flight or flying into terrain or uh, those sorts of things that are completely independent of 
all of the thought that we put into engine management. So uh, get uh, familiar with engine management techniques. Look at some of the stuff we have on the ABS website, but uh, don't uh, obsess with engine management to the exclusion of simply flying the airplane. Another uh, viewer asked, why do most of my friends resist adding an angle of attack indicator to the airplane? Well, I don't know your friends, so I'm not sure, but uh, the probably the, the first reason is that uh, angle of attack indicators are not required equipment on training airplanes and are not addressed at all in um, FAA practical tests. So in general, nobody sees them when they learn to fly and nobody is trained or evaluated on their use. So uh, they're, they're an add-on item. Another issue is that uh, angle of attack indicators that may be installed in an airplane under the NORSI program, in other words, those that do not require an STC, those that we see most of the time in our airplanes, have a couple of uh, limitations. The first is that they are not nearly as uh, accurate as the AOA devices you'll find on tactical Navy fighter jets or on airline equipment or some of the high-end business jets. Uh, I recall when the uh, first uh, angle of attack indicators were available in Bonanzas, we had an article in ABS magazine from a U.S. Air Force test pilot who had installed one in his V-tail, and he found that uh, by smoothly flying the airplane, uh, he could get as much as a seven knot variation in indicated airspeed without seeing an indicated change in the display on his angle of attack device. The fidelity in the AOAs is not there. So uh, that's probably one of the reasons also that uh, it's not as accurate as, frankly, an airspeed indicator for determining uh, the effect of changes in pitch and power. Another issue is that angle of attack indicators eligible for installation under the North Sea program uh, must be calibrated, and that calibration is usually done by the aircraft owner or pilot. Uh, I wrote about this when I calibrated the AOA device in the ABS Air Safety Foundation's A36. It is a difficult and challenging process. It really should be done with a second pilot on board to, to help with the chores, and I did do that. Uh, but it requires you to very accurately, within a knot or two, determine the stall speed of the airplane in various configurations, then uh, compute 1.3 times the stall speed in each of those configurations, then very accurately and smoothly fly the airplane for a consistent period of time at the uh, computed airspeed while uh, holding down a calibration button on the device and then repeating this for different configurations for the aircraft. In other words, uh, the device is only as good as its calibration, even given that the, uh, the fidelity is not that that you would see in a high-end jet airplane. So those are probably the reasons that uh, your friends are, are hesitant. Uh, nobody gets trained or evaluated on them. The fidelity is not there. And uh, the calibration process is is difficult to, to do properly. Uh, all of that said, I like the device that we have in the ABS airplane. Uh, it's good for teaching purposes. I can show people the effect of um, flying steep turns, for instance, on angle of attack. And it's a real good cross-check to airspeed indications uh, when I'm doing something unusual like a short field landing. It's very comforting to know that uh, the airspeed that I think I should be flying on final approach coming in over the trees is backed up by the uh, indication that I expect to see on the angle of attack device. We had one viewer question about airframe life limits. So the 58P will have to be disposed of and scrapped once it reaches 10,000 flying hours. That sounds crazy to me. Also, why, is, why does the 58TC also have this limit if it's not pressurized? The 58P and 58TC are unique amongst the ABS type airplanes in that they were certificated under Part 23 of the Federal Air Regulations. All of the other models of Beach, Bonanza, Baron, Debonair, and Traveler were certificated under CAR 3, which was superseded by uh, FAR 23. By definition, an FAR-23 airplane has to have 
life limits established for what it calls critical structures. And those critical structures are usually the, uh, the wing spar, the wing carry through section, and if the aircraft is pressurized, the, the pressure vessel. Now, the aircraft manufacturers, when they're certifying an airplane under Part 23, have a couple of avenues that they can uh, follow to arrive at this life limit figure. The first is uh, they can do meticulous engineering to uh, determine the actual structural life of various components. They can put them on flex devices and run them for, for you know, 40,000 hours of of operation, they can get into all sorts of analyses and determine exactly when the first failures will occur in these critical structures. Then they they back off. I think 50% of that figure is the life limit that's established if they go that route. The other and much simpler and easier path is to set an arbitrary life limit on these uh, critical structures. Uh, guess what most manufacturers do? Beechcraft set a 10,000 hour life limit on the critical structures, the wing spar, the wing carry through structure, and with the 58P, the pressure vessel on the uh, Part 23 airplanes in the beach piston fleet. Now, it's not just Beechcraft. For example, when the Cirrus SR-22 was introduced in 2002, it had a life limit of 2,350 hours. 2350, that's all you were able to get out of a new Cirrus when you bought one brand new back when they were first introduced. That uh, life limit has been increased now to 12,000 hours, and uh, I don't know if it was retroactive to the earlier airframes or not, but uh, over time, the manufacturer has been able to demonstrate through data derived from fleet use uh, that the structure can last longer than originally uh, anticipated, but they have to have a life limit. The Beach Duke had a 10,000 hour life limit also when it was new, set by Beechcraft. Um, the Duke Flyers Association ultimately petitioned Beechcraft to um, uh, increase that to 15,000 hours, and Beechcraft participated in some substantial engineering to prove that there was no chance of any structural issues at up to 15,000 hours in, in the Model 60 Dukes. Um, one of the engineers who was involved at the time at Beechcraft later became an ABS technical advisor. He's since passed away, but uh, he told me that uh, uh, he participated in this process and when it was done, Beechcraft said it would never again participate in a life extension program for one of its piston products. So uh, we're stuck with a 10,000 uh, hour life limit for 58Ps and 58TCs. It is a, a requirement of the certification basis of those aircraft. It's nothing special about the P-Barons or the 58TCs and it's not something that's specifically related to whether or not an airplane is pressurized. Lastly, we had some questions about pilot safety and training issues. First, one viewer asked, can you comment on the recent article about putting pilot monitoring and reporting equipment in the cockpit and the decrease in problems as a result of pilots knowing that they have been watched? Uh, we've seen several of these, uh, these uh, monitoring devices introduced in recent years. Actually, we've got a lot of them. Uh, I, I took a tour of Australia's Transport Safety Bureau uh, investigative branch several years ago uh, on one of my trips to Australia, and uh, they were showing me just how much data they can pull out of a standard iPhone uh, that uh, gives them a lot of insight into the final moments of an aircraft's movement. So uh, there's a lot out there. Now there are devices that can be installed in an airplane. Uh, Star Insurance has a program where uh, you can install a device that monitors and scores your flying and uploads that to the insurance company. And if you consistently get a certain score, you might be able to get a discount on your insurance renewal. Talk to your agent if you're interested in that sort of thing. 
Uh, other devices, uh, ForeFlight has some good monitoring and they're increasing that. I understand that they're increasing uh, the, um, the number of items that are tracked in ForeFlight. Uh, Cloud Ahoy was really a pioneer. It's primarily used for uh, doing video playbacks for flight instruction purposes, but it collects and stores data. But uh, the whole idea, uh, actually it's called FOQA data. I don't remember what FOQA stands for, but it's an acronym that applies primarily to airline and large corporate flight department uh, programs where um, data is monitored, it's collected, it's evaluated by real human beings and then management decisions and uh, pilot assignments and maybe even disciplinary action are meted out by the company's um, program directors to try to uh, uh, eliminate any safety discrepancies and, and make the, the total operation safer. Uh, some of uh, my contemporaries, for example, the, the Malibu Mirage Owner and Pilots Association is beginning to invest very heavily in a system through which volunteer participants in the MOPA, MMOPA organization, can upload data to a uh, database that will be de-identified and then used to uh, determine trends in the owner-flown owner fleet and hopefully result in training <clears throat> products by that organization to uh, its uh, members uh, to improve flying safety. Uh, yeah, we've had a couple of articles about how this might apply to Bonanza Baron type aircraft, and I've been talking with some of the folks, um, but uh, I, I've asked a lot of members and there doesn't seem to be a, a great deal of interest in participation in a program like that. Uh, that may change and we may have a generational change where that sort of thing is more accepted by uh, beach pilots and uh, we'll see if some point in the future we can get better safety information uh, by having actual data from taken in real time during fleet operations. Uh, but uh, yeah, there, I, there, there are some, some things that could, positive things that can happen, but primarily in a flight department, airline, or military uh, uh, operation. We really don't have the structure to uh, look over flight data from 10,000 ABS members and then uh, try to uh, comment on, on every little uh, bounced landing and that sort of thing. So it, it's it's a long way off in our, in our uh, organization. That said, you might participate in some of these, I use four flight data. I like to fly, play back some of my flights to see how well I flew a practice approach or an actual approach and, and such. So you can use it in your personal briefing and debriefing. And I'm trying to incorporate it a little bit in debriefing after instructional flights, but it, it takes some time to get set up and it, it's hard to get ready for a debrief uh, quickly enough uh, using this sort of system. At least that's my, my experience so far. Another question. Any thoughts about AQP, Advanced Qualification Program, is applicable to general aviation aircraft? Um, general aviation aircraft do not need an AQP, and I'll tell you why. We already have every authority that an AQP provides to a training provider. AQP, by definition, applies to Part 121 and Part 135 FAA approved training programs. If you fly for an airline or you fly for a 135 uh, operator, you will have to have pre-approved every training profile, every lesson plan, everything you do for the pilots, with the pilots, for their currency and their qualification, uh, you have to get that all pre-approved from the FAA and you're not permitted to deviate from that syllabus once it's been approved. AQP is an FAA industry program that permits operators to deviate from their approved plan if they think they can provide training that will substantially increase safety or address hot topic items with their operation uh, that are not normally covered in their approved syllabus. Uh, this is a, a great way for 121 and 135 operators to incorporate scenario-based training and to uh, maybe even try to 
uh, put pilots in a scenario that is similar to a recent accident everyone's been talking about and see if that pilot, if that pilot or those crew members can successfully uh, deal with whatever situation may have occurred. Uh, so ACP is by definition a way for a, a uh, training provider that has an approved syllabus to deviate from that syllabus to address hot topics. Those of us in the general aviation world, or at least those of us not part 135 in the GA world, already have all of the authority we want to, to create our own training scenarios. So uh, although the idea of incorporating scenario-based training is a very good one, and any decent instructor used scenarios long before we used the term scenario-based training, we don't need special authority from the federal government to be able to do that in our training because we already have it. We're not operating on approved syllabi, so we can do whatever we feel as instructors we need to do to uh, create a learning environment. So AQP, great for the 121 and 135 crowd, not applicable at all to those of us flying Bonanzas, Barons, Debonairs, and Travelers. Last question. Why don't aviation groups advocate for scenario-based training, such as engine outs, go-arounds, loss of thrust on takeoff, as a necessary part of a flight review? I was invited many years ago to be a participant in an NTSB symposium in Washington, D.C., where I made an appeal to the FAA to do that very thing. I suggested mirroring the instrument proficiency check, which does require that we complete a full list of tasks and require also that they be flown to instrument check ride standards in order to be given an IPC endorsement. I thought we could do the same thing with a flight review. It wouldn't have to be as extensive, but it could be that uh, even as an industry, we all say for the next two years, we're going to focus on loss of control scenarios. And in order to be endorsed for a flight review, you would have to have completed uh, some sort of loss of control scenario in that two year period. The next two years, we might all focus on accuracy in takeoffs and landings. And you would have to cover that in addition, perhaps to something else in order to get a flight review during that period. And the idea would be for a consensus among flight instructors and industry um, and supported by the FAA where we address the things that are causing the most accidents. And, and that, those things are going to change over time, especially if we are successful in addressing some things, we'll be able to move on to others and, and widen everybody's uh, experience and education along the way. Well, of course, the NTSB can only make recommendations to the FAA. To the best of my knowledge, it, it did not pass that rec recommendation off. Uh, historically, in 35 years as a flight instructor, every time I've seen any uh, proposal to uh, add requirements to the flight review, uh, the alphabet organizations, primarily AOPA and EAA, have argued against it and uh, eventually uh, none have been adopted. Uh, the, uh, these or organizations are, you know, in, they're, they're trying to support their members and uh, they're trying to avoid uh, the increase in regulatory requirements uh, for flying an airplane. Uh, you know, that's all well and good, but uh, there wouldn't be any increase in the amount of time required, nor Therefore, the increase, any increase in the amount of money it would cost to make a flight review focus on some hot topic item like that and have a specific requirement in order to call it a flight review. Uh, the good news is that we don't have to wait for the federal government to tell us what we can and cannot do on a flight review. Uh, we as instructors, as groups of instructors, and as um, 
um, as an industry, we can decide to do it ourselves. And I'm working with folks in the Type Club coalitions, which are my counterparts in other uh, organizations that support different types of airplanes. I'm also working with the NBAA's uh, Owner Pilot Association Coalition, which is sort of the same thing, but it's on mainly the turboprop and the high-end piston world aircraft there. And I think we're all, you know, all of my counterparts are interested in uh, making flight reviews more effective and more enjoyable for pilots uh, by making them meaningful. So it's really up to us to do that, uh, whether or not there's an FAR that tells us that we have to do these things. Well, thank you to the viewers of the recent webinar who sent in their questions. And thank you for giving me the, uh, the time to uh, finish answering the questions that we received in this uh, ABS hangar installment. You may watch the full webinar, including many more questions and answers, under webinars in the ABS Online Learning Center. For ABS and the ABS Air Safety Foundation, I'm Tom Turner. Thanks for becoming an even safer Beechcraft pilot. Log in or become a member at bonanza.org. Don't miss another edition of The ABS Hangar. Subscribe to the American Bonanza Society YouTube channel. We'll see you next time in The ABS Hangar.